Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kata. I'm Graham Mitchell. I'm a member of the uh, Infrastructure New Zealand Board and I'm here to introduce uh, Dr Susie Wiles, the Associate Professor at University of Auckland. Many of you would have seen Susie on our TV screens, uh, heard her on radio, on podcast, online, on almost every platform um, advising us throughout this pandemic to date. Susie has been recognised many times for her amazing contributions of science and society in Aotearoa. In 2019, she was made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for Services to Microbiology and Science Communication. Prior to this, she had been honoured as a Blake leader by the Sir Peter Blake Trust, as well as winning the Royal Society Te Angaranga Kalahane um, Medal and the Prime Minister's Science and Media Communication Prize. Most recently, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Susie has been one of our primary faces, communicators and educators in Aotearoa, helping ease the public's anxiety through lockdown and beyond. This led Susie being, to be named the supreme winner of the Stuff Westpac Woman of Influence Awards in 2020, and most recently Kiwi Banks New Zealander of the Year in 2021. So I'd now I'd like to introduce Susie for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, talk to you all today about um, COVID-19 uh, and vaccinations and basically what things are going to look like, I guess, once we all start um, moving into this sort of new new world with COVID. So I want to start just by talking about the disease itself so that we're all on the same page about really um, what it is that we're trying to prevent with the tools that we have. So it's obviously um, this virus disease uh, and uh, it's pretty deadly. Um, but what we do know is that the, um, the death toll that we currently have is the official death toll is probably a massive underestimate. So already we know that about 5 million people around the world have died, um, but this is likely an underestimate because not many places, uh, not everywhere is counting deaths, but also it doesn't um, include the deaths that are caused uh, by the fact that the pandemic has actually overwhelmed the health systems in, in many countries. So The Economist has this project going where they look at what we call excess deaths. So these are deaths that are happening uh, in countries um, that wouldn't normally happen uh, if we weren't in a pandemic. Um, and they estimate that, that using this excess death method, um, that it could be as many as 10 to 20 million people have actually died um, during this pandemic. So it's clearly a very uh, deadly disease. But it's not just about deaths, right? It's about what happens to those people who survive disease. Um, and so I just want to show here, this is just some data from a few days ago from New Zealand, um, basically showing that it's affecting um, every age. Uh, so, you know, we know that in the very beginning of the pandemic, um, it was the elderly who were most impacted. And we certainly know that they are most likely to have a bad outcome. Um, but, you know, the virus has changed. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and what we see now is basically cases and hospitalizations um, in, in, every, uh, in every age. Um, so this is a disease that affects everybody. Uh, and it's a disease that can leave many, many people with long-term um, uh, health problems. Uh, certainly long-term, or, or uh, we know in the short term, so the kind of year to two-year um, period, uh, but it's looking like it's setting up um, impacts that could have, uh, you know, could be felt for many years. So this is what's known as long COVID. Um, and what you can see here from this picture is uh, the reason that we think long COVID happens is because this is a virus that can um, uh, infect many different types of cells in the body. So it's not just infecting cells of the nose and throat, uh, it's infecting, uh, infecting many cells. And that's because it uses a receptor called ACE2, and that's found on many different types of cells in the body. So we think that possibly as many as a third of people who get COVID can end up with this long COVID. Um, it looks like it's about three different types of syndromes. Um, and so people can have different types of symptoms. So some people report having brain fog, um, being unable to think clearly, and that's massively impacting on their ability to work. We have others who have um, been suffering from fatigue for many, many months. Um, others who uh, end up with um, heart damage and palpitations. Um, all sorts of things. And I guess the real concern is actually what, you know, what damage is this causing and what is it um, essentially setting people up for in the long term? Uh, my real worry is we're going to end up seeing increases in dementia, um, you know, increases in heart problems, diabetes, uh, all sorts of stuff that are going to be a massive impact on the health systems of many countries. Um, but another thing that's starting to pop up that I think will be of interest to your audience um, is that there's a, um, there is now starting to become um, data on what we call sexual dysfunction. 
So this is people who have had an infection um, and then in the months afterwards are basically reporting to their doctors um, that they are basically suffering from things like erectile dysfunction, or premature ejaculation or not being able to ejaculate at all. There's also some um, evidence starting to appear that for some people it might also bring on an early menopause. So it may well be that this has a massive impact on fertility um, and it's something that we probably won't see, you know, for another year or so. Uh, we've likely seen a bit of a birth, um, a baby boom from people being, uh, you know, in, in lockdown around the world. Uh, but what we may well see in the next year or two is, is to start to see a drop in birth rates as this impacts on fertility. Okay, so that's the disease. Um, it's definitely not one that I want, and I don't think anybody should um, should want to catch that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the virus uh, and the variants. So what this virus does, uh, I guess the way to think about viruses is that they're not really alive until they get inside of a host cell. And then what they do is they use that host cell to turn it into a virus producing factory. And the first step of doing that is to basically make copies of the virus's genetic material, in this case, um, RNA. And so in this process of making these copies, um, sometimes just by sheer chance, little mistakes, little errors get introduced. Um, this virus is actually very good um, at making pretty good copies of itself. But as I say, we see these little, um, these little variations introduced. Uh, and basically, most of the time, these variants, uh, these variations will have no impact on the virus at all. Um, they actually end up being really useful for us to be able to track um, you know, um, using whole genome sequencing, how the virus is changing and who infected who. Sometimes they will give the virus a disadvantage, um, in which case we will then see that those particular um, variations uh, kind of die out. But sometimes, just by sheer chance, they will give the virus an advantage. And then these are the ones that we start to see um, taking over. So we, this is what gives us what we call our variants of interest and variants of concern. So these are basically mutated versions of the virus, um, which uh, either start off, they have some kind of, of these errors that look like they give the virus an advantage that, that becomes the virus um, variants of interest. Um, and then as we really see those advantages take place, then they become variants of concern. And of course, the big variant of concern at the moment um, is Delta. And they become a variant of concern if they are basically more transmissible, if they um, change uh, in a bad way, the way that they cause disease or hospitalizations, um, or if they make the virus um, better able to evade our, uh, our ways of stopping it. Um, and one of the big ones of those is our vaccines. So at the moment, we know that Delta is um, incredibly infectious and the one that we're watching for. So just some statistics about Delta. So basically, people who are infected with Delta have got about a thousand times higher viral load than people who were infected early in the pandemic with, um, you know, earlier versions of the virus. Uh, and this is why we see so many more people um, end up being infected from a single case. So what used to happen earlier in the pandemic is, you know, if a person got COVID, they might only spread it to one or two other people unless they were in a kind of super spreader event. Um, now we see that if the virus gets into somebody in a workplace or a household, uh, basically almost everyone ends up getting um, infected. We also know that it has a shorter incubation period. So before, um, so basically when you get exposed to the virus, um, it takes a little while for the virus to kind of get set up uh, and before you uh, become infectious and start to show symptoms. And with the earlier versions of the virus, this period was kind of two to 10 days with most people testing positive at about day seven. With Delta, most people start to test positive at about day three or four. So this is a virus that moves much faster, um, infecting many more people within a shorter period of time. Um, and then the other thing that's been very sad about this is basically it has a higher hospitalization rate. And this has been looking at some data from the UK where they compared people who had Delta versus people who had um, Alpha, which is one of their earlier, um, uh, earlier variants, and showed that more people ended up being hospitalized with Delta. What we know, though, is that wherever via the virus continues to transmit, um, wherever it turns people into virus producing factories, it will continue to evolve. So we don't know how Delta is going to change in the future, whether it's going to become more or less infectious, whether it's going to become more or less deadly, whether it's going to um, start to impact on our vaccines. Um, and that's kind of why I think we need to, all of us need to be um, stopping the transmission of this virus as much as we can. 
Okay, so how do we stop COVID-19? Well, we've got a huge toolbox, right? Um, and different countries have been using different bits of the toolbox in different ways. So obviously here in New Zealand, we've used border closures and border controls to stop um, the case, you know, stop the virus coming into the country. We've had this um, test, trace, isolate strategy, which is basically rapid testing, you know, of everybody who has symptoms. Um, if they're identified, isolating them, contact tracing and um, isolating all of the contacts. Um, and then we've had, you know, obviously the, the lockdown um, things, which is limiting um, people's interactions with each other. And then we've had all the things that we do as individuals. So um, distancing, hand washing, wearing masks, all of these kinds of things. And the really important thing is that um, each of these are not, um, we, we, we call this the Swiss cheese model because each of these interventions is not perfect. But if you line them up, um, then you can kind of get the best, uh, the best out of all of them. And that's what we need to continue to do. So, of course, the big intervention that has happened over the last year or so has been the vaccine. So a way to try and prevent infection um, in people in the first place. And this is just showing you that while we have several vaccines that have been approved for full use around the world. So this is um, so eight. This is the vaccine tracker that shows that there are actually like over 100 that are still in clinical trials. Some of these will be um, variations on what we have already. Others will be delivering it in different ways. So, for example, the virus, uh, the vaccine that we have at the moment is one that goes into our arm. Others are looking at ones that go up our nose and um, all sorts of things. So it may well be that we end up with a better vaccine um, in the future. But we certainly have, um, as I say, eight around the world right now. Um, and we know they are making a massive, massive impact. So we know that these vaccines have been, you know, there were there were sort of tens of thousands of people involved in the trials, um, but they've now been given to millions and millions of people around the world. Um, so this is just some data from our outbreak. I'm um, showing the difference in cases between people who are vaccinated and not vaccinated. So we obviously have a large portion of our population at the moment who can't be vaccinated because they are under 12. Um, but the vast majority of our cases have been either those um, or, who, or people who have not been vaccinated. We also know that it takes two weeks after a, your second dose for you to be fully protected. And so we have seen people who are partially vaccinated um, to, who have become cases too. But as you can see from this, the vast majority of people are either partially vaccinated or not vaccinated. So vaccines are doing a really good job of protecting people from being cases in the first place. The other thing we know is that they also do a really, really good job of people keeping people out of hospital. Hospital. So again, this is just breaking down our cases by not vaccinated, partly, partially vaccinated or fully vaccinated. And again, the fully vaccinated category is the smallest of all. So um, essentially, people who are fully vaccinated, you know, this is a vaccine that really well protects um, against uh, hospitalization too. So I guess the, the you know the this is a, a really important measure that we have um, to protect us as individuals, um, and we are using you know one of the safest and most effective vaccines that there is in the world um, available. So this is just some data from the different trials. Um, it's a little bit of a confusing um, diagram, but what you can see basically is the little dots are essentially the um, how effective each different type of vaccine are, um, is. So the light blue is the Pfizer one that we're using in New Zealand. The Moderna is the red, and that's um, sort of the equivalent uh, vaccine um, in the USA, so an mRNA vaccine. Uh, the AstraZeneca and the Janssen are a different type, a different technology of vaccines, and they are given in the um, yellow and the kind of uh, purpley blue line. Um, and so what you really want is those dots to be as close to 100 as possible. So as close to um, you know, preventing as, mi as many cases um, as possible. Uh, and all you can see here is basically divided by um, whether uh, it was kind of the overall result from the trial or by age or by male and female. And what you can see is essentially consist consistently the um, mRNA vaccines are the most effective. So they prevent the most um, number of cases and hospitalizations. But I guess what you can see from this data is that it's not 100%, right? So this is um, data from healthy individuals. And we know that not every healthy individual will be protected, but, but most of them will. But, you know, what about all the other people in our community? So this is a slide that was put together by the CDC. Um, it takes data from 63 different studies and looks at whether the people in those studies um, made basically an antibody response. And the antibodies are the way that your um, body protects you after, um, 
you know, from vaccination. And so what we really want is to see these, these little dots as high as possible, um, as close to that dotted line, which is the, um, the results from the people, uh, the healthy people in the trials. And so what we can see is that um, essentially, depending on what kind of condition you have, whether it's some types of cancers, whether you're, you're on um, hemodialysis for a kidney disease, whether you've had an organ transplant, or whether you're on immunosuppressive therapies, there will be people who have not made a really good immune response after vaccination. So these people can be safely vaccinated, but they will not be protected as well as healthy people. So this is really important because this means, you know, this is why some of those vaccinated people can still end up being cases and can still end up in hospital is because the vaccine does not protect everybody. But this is why more and more of us need to be um, vaccinated because the more of us are vaccinated, the less of us will catch it, will spread it to others, the more it protects everyone around us. Okay. The other big question that, um, that we still don't know yet is how long does protection last? So um, the data is really clear that um, it starts to, our protection starts to wane after um, six months. It doesn't disappear immediately. Um, so it will sort of go, you know, um, sort of gradually decrease. Uh, and that's why boosters have been brought in for people who have been vaccinated, um, you know, six months ago. What we don't yet know is how long that um, booster will give us protection for. Uh, it could be a long time. It could be another one that, that um, wanes quite quickly. So what we don't yet know is, um, is whether we will need regular boosters uh, or whether that next one dose is enough. Um, and we'll, we will find that out probably fairly soon um, because there are countries like Israel and the UK and now the USA who have been giving boosters for the last few months. So we'll get to see um, how protective they might be. Um, so moving on for the last few minutes, basically, on um, how do we protect people in your industry? So what uh, I guess what we really need to understand from this is how does the virus uh, transmit? Um, and so what I want you to think about here is, uh, is what we call the disease triangle. So what we have is um, the virus as, as one kind of entity. Um, and obviously the virus uh, is changing in terms of, uh, you know, the variants arising and stuff. So what we don't know is how that virus is going to change in the future. Uh, we then have the host, which is every one of us. Um, and as you've seen from the data, you know, we're all different, right? Um, so we all have uh, different underlying immune responses, different underlying, uh, potentially underlying conditions. Um, and so that means that we, you know, each of us, you can line us all up and we can get the same vi um, virus but we can uh, be impacted in really different ways. And so we've, we really see that from the cases that we've had. Some people you know, develop long COVID, others don't. And we don't fully understand yet why, why that happens. The same with vaccination. Some people will mount a really good response, others not so great. So we're all kind of individuals. And then the last bit of the triangle is the environment. Uh, and so this could be um, this is, could be our physical environment. This could be our you know where do we live, where do we work, what is our exposure to to um, the virus. Uh, but this also you know could be um, uh, to do with where you know countries and stuff. Um, and what has been really astonishing to me as a microbiologist has been to see that you know we've had the same virus uh, you know rampaging around the world, and the response has been really, really different, right? How the pandemic has played out has been really different, um, partly because of, uh, you know, who the hosts are, but more because of the environment um, and, uh, you know, geopolitical um, kind of um, political ideology, I guess, and, and leadership. So things have been playing out really differently. But what it means um, for thinking about the virus moving forward is that we have to look at each of these things um, individually, right? So we have to assume that the virus is going to change, and that might mean that our responses need to change um, um, as we go forward. But it means that when we're thinking about risk uh, to each of us, um, we need to think about these, um, both the host and the environment differently. So if we think about the host, um, what this means is going to be that uh, people who are vaccinated will still have a different degree of risk, depending on whether they, um, you know, fall into one of these categories of having um, essentially, uh, you know, do they have some form of cancer? You know, some of these forms of cancers are not, um, they're like chronic cancers that people can live very, you know, uh, productive lives with, right? It's not, it's not like people who are on chemotherapy. Um, similarly, there are people who have kidney disease who are also lead, leading, you know, productive lives and working and things. Um, so you may not know who the person is. You know, you may not know that the colleague sat next to you um, is at increased risk, right? They might not look it. 
but we all have to think about this when we think of this kind of collective, um, how do we look after each other? So we think about, um, and, and as I say, the kind of vaccination is one of these really good ways of protecting us as individuals, but we don't know whether um, each of us is going to be fully protected. So what are the other ways, I guess, that we can protect each other? Um, well, one of them is wearing masks. And I put this up as an example of not <laughs> of a mask not to wear. Somebody sent this to me the other day. Um, they went into a shop and this is what people were wearing. So, you know, what we know is this virus is airborne. Um, and so this is somebody who is going to be, you know, either breathing in or breathing out um, a virus because this, this, this does nothing but stop their droplets essentially from, from uh, leaving their face. So what we know is that people who, um, what we know about this va uh, virus is that, you know, people are infectious before they realize it. Um, if you're vaccinated, you know, you may well end up having very, very mild symptoms. Um, and so, but you could still be infectious. What we do know, though, is that people who are vaccinated are infectious for much less time. So that's also really, really important. But it does mean that we can't rely on vaccines alone. Um, and that's why we should be adding um, masks to our toolkit. So what we know about masks that are really good are, um, you know, are these um, uh, N95 masks. So masks that are actually really good at filtering out the proper um, virus size, size particles. But actually another one that might be more useful for your industry are what we call PAPAs. So these are um, ones that we actually use uh, in the lab for airborne to stop us when we're working with airborne um, bacteria and viruses. And these are really much more comfortable to wear. So you can, you know, you can see people's faces and you can talk through them. And essentially what they have is this little unit. Um, there are actually much smaller units than that one that have got a HEPA filter in them that basically um, take the air, uh, take the outside air, put it through a filter and then send it into your mask. So they're much more comfortable to wear. They're a little bit noisy because they have this beautiful airflow, um, but they will be a really good way, I think, of people working in really close proximity to each other to be able to do that safely, um, vaccinated or unvaccinated. Uh, the other really important thing is going to be still getting tested and isolating, even if symptoms are mild. You know, we really need to be able to stop transmission. Um, and so one of the things that may be useful for this is going to be the um, rapid tests. What I want to say, though, is that rapid tests um, do have disadvantages. So this is just a study from the UK that looked at um, the correlation between using a rapid test with using the standard PCR test that we that we use. So the standard PCR basically gets taken away to be um, to be run. Uh, and what they showed was that um, so this graph basically shows that the the higher the viral load, so basically the um, the more virus you're emitting, you know, you're very, you're, you're, um, you'll be very quickly positive on a PCR test, um, but you'll also like more likely to be positive on these, um, on these uh, rapid tests. Whereas um, people who are shedding much less virus are basically much less likely to test positive on these, um, on these, uh, these rapid tests. So a big study that was done that looked at a whole bunch of these different tests, so 48 studied, essentially showed that people with symptoms, they'll probably miss about two to three out of every 10 cases. And if people don't have symptoms, they'll miss about three to six out of every 10 cases. So these tests are useful, but they do not guarantee that somebody with COVID-19 will not be picked up um, from them. So it might end up being going to work. Okay. Um, the last thing I just want to talk about um, is environment. And I guess what we're all going to need to be doing moving forward is looking at, you know, what is the environment that we're working in? And so how much at risk does that put us um, of, um, of transmission? And so this is where we really, really need to understand transmission. So at the beginning of this pandemic, you know, we thought that this virus was spread through droplets. And so these are kind of big droplets that basically when people cough um, and uh, sneeze, they quickly fall to the ground. And that was why it was really important to stay a kind of distance away from each other um, and to keep washing our hands and keep cleaning surfaces. But actually what we know now is the virus is airborne. So there may still be a chance of getting it from a surface, but the the predominant way it transmits is through the air. And so that's people are basically breathing out these particles. Uh, they When they talk, when they sing, when they shout, you get more and more particles in the air. And then basically um, people will be infected by either coming into close contact with that air or essentially moving through that air even after the infected person has left. And what's really important about this um, uh, infected air is that basically when you're in a closed environment, that is when this air kind of accumulates um, and that's what, when people are most at risk. 
So it's kind of confined environments um, with a lack of fresh air, with a lack of air changes uh, that put people most at risk. Outdoors is much less risk. So basically, that's what we kind of need to avoid, confined, badly ventilated spaces. If it's difficult to do that, though, there are ways to protect people. So one of them is um, looking at using things like these CO2 detectors, which can basically tell you about um, how much uh, or how stuffy, um, you know, unventilated um, a room is. And the WHO suggests that um, they should be kept at below um, 800 uh, parts per million. So, you know, this can be as simple as having these units in places, they're very, very cheap, um, and then uh, essentially opening windows, making sure that the, um, you know, that places are ventilated once they kind of start to creep up to that level. The other way, though, again, in, in buildings or places where that is not practical, um, is to use air purifiers. And so this is one that the um, Australian government is investing in for their schools. Uh, and so these can be put in places and basically take the air, they put it through one of these HEPA filters to remove, um, you know, the vast majority of the virus particles. Uh, and so that means that these confined spaces are much more safe. So I think these are all of the things that we're going to have to do moving forward. You know, we combine vaccines with masks, with ventilation, with purification. Um, these are the things that we can basically do to make sure that we're as safe as possible um, moving forward. And with that, I will... Um, stop sharing my screen and we can start the questions. Uh, thanks for that, Susie. That was a great presentation. Um, some questions started to come through, but I'll, I'll just kick off with a couple if you don't mind. Um, you, you had a few things there around that you could use in close proximity. Of course, in our industry, we have, you know, different types of activities going on. Quite a bit of the activities are actually outdoors. But if you go to actually a large commercial vertical construction site, a lot of it is indoors, um, particularly when they're finishing off the works, when it's all enclosed. And in a lot of those cases, there isn't the air conditioning yet in place because they obviously haven't put it in place. Um, and so, the, and people are working in close proximity. So what are extra sort of things or precautions do you think um, the industry could take in those sorts of environments, particularly when you've got on some of our sites, you know, up to 200 to 500 workers in a close proximity. Yeah, I mean, I guess the thing that I would like us to be really getting um, getting rid of as an idea is this kind of safe distance space and that suddenly, you know, if you're one metre apart or two metre apart, you're kind of magically safer, right? <laughs> Um, cause it's not true indoor, you know, or in a badly ventilated space if you're there for any length of time, because you're still breathing basically the same air. So I think that's where these other precautions need to come in. So, um, you know, the, the definitely wearing well fitted masks. The reason I put the papas up there actually is because they're not something that I've seen many people talk about using. And yet, they are much more practical, um, much more comfortable for, uh, you know, longer term use, uh, especially when it's hot, because actually they they sort of waft fresh air at you. So they, they can, they're, as I say, they're a little bit noisy, but they actually can be um, much more comfortable to wear. So I think those kinds of things and then really thinking about, you know, air purifiers. So uh, they're, they're essentially portable things. They can be moved around. Um, and so putting them in spaces so that you know that if there's somebody there, who is infectious, um, you know, being able to kind of clear clear that out. So I think these these all these things have to be layered up. You know, we know that vaccination is a really really good protection. So, you know, that that to me is the is the first one. You know, you're much less likely to be a case if you're vaccinated. Um, but we do know that cases happen, and so then the question is, you know, either how do you detect them really quickly, and if there is somebody there who hasn't been detected, how do you make sure that they don't spread it to someone else? And that's where all of these other measures. Um, uh, come in. Um, yeah, so I, th I think we just have to line them all up, basically. Yeah, and you can see the Victorian state government adopted vaccine mandates in the construction sector, which obviously didn't go down too well with some of the workers in that sector. Yeah, and I think, so, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of mandates. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of forcing people to do anything. But what's been really dis distressing, I guess, to see is that people need those mandates in order to do the right thing. You know, and what we need to be thinking about is um, is why why do we use these protections? I mean, it's really interesting in your industry, right? You have a whole mm. bunch of protections that are required, right? You can't go on site without a hard hat, without, without all these things. And so it's really interesting that people haven't, you know, that people don't see the vaccinations or masking in the same way. 
And that's partly because of the way they're being framed by people who are pushing misinformation. So, you know, they're very much being seen as a your rights kind of, you know, thing. But I don't hear people complaining in the product, you know, in the in the construction industry about their rights being infringed when they have to wear a hard hat or something. And it's exactly the same thing. I know that for, um, you know, wearing, uh, taking a vaccine maybe seems, you know, a more risky thing because you're actually having to do an act, you're having to, to get a vaccine. But, you know, what we know is that these are incredibly safe and effective. Um, and everything that people are worried about or have been told to worry about with the vaccines are things that we know happen with COVID-19 at a much higher level. So I wish people would... Um, maybe understand that there, you know, that this, that we see this, we have people who are trying to disrupt our, you know, protections against COVID. We know vaccines are a really good protection. And so people make up crap all the time to try and, you know, to try and, 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 and push their agenda. Um, and one of the ways they do this is by focusing on our individual rights rather than our, um, rather than the consequences for us and others if we aren't vaccinated and get infected. Um, but also, um, you know, our individual rights come with responsibilities as part of society, um, a responsibility to ourselves, a responsibility to our friends and family, to our workmates. Um, and so I think we need to see vaccines and masks in all, you know, in that same way as we do other safety measures. Yeah, which is a, a bit of a segue into the, the vaccine hesitancy sort of issue. And, and you, you can go to the official website such as MedSafe or the... Um, vaccine you know, event reporting website that's actually run by CDC in the US and they're, they're very complex websites um, with enormous amounts of data but they do tend to lack sort of causal relationship type in information that's easily understood by general public so how, how do you think the public health officials can better get those messages out there so the general public can actually understand when they're looking at that information that you know a, a lot of these non-causal impacts and actual causal in themselves. Yeah, I mean the, the I guess these are very much um, trying to be um, open, uh, giving people ways to report data. Um, you know, and, and the, it's really really important that people feel like you know if they've had an impact, um, if something has happened to them after they've been vaccinated, that they have a way of reporting this. But what we have to remember is that when uh, when we roll out vaccines, when we roll out any medicine on the scale that we've been doing with this pandemic, and frankly, we haven't done anything on this scale before, um, there will be things that happen to individuals that would have happened anyway, right? Every day, people have heart attacks, strokes, you know, all of these kinds of things. And so what's really important is that people, um, is that the people who understand <laughs> these things actually look and say, well, you know, have our rates increased at all? Is this exactly what we would expect in the kind of general public? Or is there a causal link here with the vaccines? Uh, and so we know there are a couple of things that are um, that happen um, that are more likely to happen if you're vaccinated than not vaccinated. Um, so these are a couple of, well, at least one rare blood clot um, and also this heart inflammation that particularly happens to young men. But what we also know is that if you get COVID, <laughs> your chances of getting both of those things and many other things is much, much higher. So I guess these websites are places where the data is put for transparency's sake. And all over the place, it says really clearly, you know, this, this is unfiltered, hasn't been analysed. But because that takes time and then that ends up being kind of put somewhere else. And so what's really unfortunate is, is this kind of drive to be transparent, but leaving, you know, people with the impression that maybe these things are related and, and they're simply not, you know, and every time there is something that's found to be related, then people are told about it and, and are told this is a symptom we need you to watch out for. And if you have any of these symptoms, please get help because this, you know, something something needs to, to be done. So it's just a really unfortunate thing. And I guess the other thing is that these people who are spreading misinformation, you know, they 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 leap on this kind of, of stuff um, and they use it to spread um, lies and falsehoods about, about the vaccines. And that's just, you know, the way that social media works means that those lies travel much faster than any good information ever would. Thanks for that. Um, one of the questions that has popped up, which I know a number of parents are thinking about at the moment, given it's a cohort which cannot get access to vaccines without sending children back to a primary school, um, where basically all the children are on 
vaccinated by definition, but the teachers are mandated to be vaccinated. What do you think parents should be thinking about in that regard? Yeah, so, you know, again, we want society to continue functioning, right? And we know that there are people in our society who are not protected by vaccinations. And so that means that the rest of us need to be vaccinated. And so it is absolutely right that children, you know, that teachers who are working with children um, should be vaccinated. But again, it shouldn't be the only measure that we use, right? So um, that's where we want schools to be looking at, you know, uh, do they have their ventilation sorted? You know, um, it, I mean, at least we're moving into summer, so being able to teach um, outside more. These are all really important things that we use all of the measures. Um, and if a teacher, you know, if a teacher do doesn't have a legitimate reason for not wanting to be vaccinated, then you'd have to ask, like, what, you know, they're, they're, what, what do they think about the children in their care? And, the, and you know, the... the um, I mean, this is the this is the thing I really struggle with with people who are hesitant to be, you know, it's, it's fine to have questions and to you know need information, but for those who've really just staunchly taken that it's my right, what about the rights of the people around you to live a health, you know, safe and healthy life? And um, and that's you know, as I say, being part of society comes with responsibilities. Yeah, one question that's popped up, I'm not too sure whether you'd be able to answer it, is when would a sort of surveillance saliva surveillance testing regime be available in sort of workplaces so at a construction site that could be used as, as a tool? Um, I don't know. That's not something I'm yeah. uh, involved in at all. I mean, I guess the important thing is that there are a couple of different ways that tests, um, that tests are done. So there's the saliva testing that is... Um, just is that it's still PCR testing, but using saliva rather than a nasal swab. And then there's these um, rapid tests. So that test takes the same time as a normal PCR. And then there's these more rapid tests that can either be done using saliva or using a nasal swab that then take sort of 15 to 30 minutes to, to um, you know, to work. Um, and those rapid tests were the ones that uh, were basically banned at the beginning because they were so unreliable and so many countries spent millions on these tests and they basically had to throw them all away. So it's um, what we kind of want are, you know, if people are going to be routinely tested, we want a way that's more compatible to them. So rather than not, you know, not having a swab stuck up their nose all the time, uh, you know, having these better ways to, 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 to give a sample. But, you know, the, it, it takes quite a lot of saliva and um, depending on the test, it can be, you know, you, you mustn't eat or you mustn't smoke, you know, so there's every test that we have comes with advantages and disadvantages. And I guess it's all about as we move forward, understanding what the disadvantages and advantages are and making sure they're right for whatever workplace needs to use them. Um, and, the, you know, the government's just had a big review done of this. Um, they've been, you know, the Ministry of Health have been squarely told they need to get their act together and, you know, make things more available. And it's going to be about what is the right thing and everybody understanding the pros and cons of each approach. Yeah, there's a few questions popped up about masking. You mentioned the N95s, which, which aren't that easy for the public to get hold of. What's the sort of difference, you know, between that and the general surgical masks that people generally buy from the supermarkets? And also, you've also got people using cloth masks, you know, um, that you can buy as well. Yeah, so we know that... A mask is better than no mask, but there are obviously masks that are better than than others. So it kind of the N95 is the is the sort of the best mask um, because that's the one that uh, really does uh, stop kind of you know viral particles because of the size of the the holes in the, in the material. Um, next up would be the surgical um, masks, and then after that would be the cloth masks. Um, and then you can get depending on you know you can have a single layer or a double layer or even a triple layer cloth mask, and they become kind of more or less protective. Um, you know, people have moved to cloth masks because they because of the environmental impact of the surgical masks. Uh, we know actually though that surgical masks can be just um, uh, rewashed uh, or washed um, and dried uh, and and used um, several times. And you can also layer them up with a cloth mask, right? So there are uh, the important thing is that the more people who wear them, the more protected everyone will be because they basically, if you are if you are infectious, they kind of um, they lower the amount of virus that you have, and if you are in, uh, if you're exposed, they again lower the amount of virus that you're exposed to. So something is better than nothing, but there are obviously things that are better mm -hmm. than others. Yeah, one question just popped up, and this could take a long time to answer. So if you could <laughs> cut to the you know, you know to give yeah. us a elevator pitch on a lot of people are interested in 
what's the difference between an mRNA vaccine and a normal vaccine, which is effectively a, a, a culture, um, and, and how the mRNA vaccine actually works. <laughs> that is definitely, I can see the timer saying we've got five seconds. There's no way I <laughs> yeah, can answer right. that question in five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you want me? Okay, I can give you a read. So there's Helicopter. actually lots of different ways that we make yeah. um, vaccines. And um, so the mRNA are basically just delivering uh, essentially the message, the recipe to make the, um, the protein that our immune response looks at. Uh, so it's just a kind of a, a slightly different way. It's using um, the way our cells uh, work all the time. So it's using a completely natural process in our, in our body. Uh, and that mRNA is really fragile. So it doesn't last very long. Um, it uh, it basically um, degrades within a few hours or a few days, and then it's gone. Um, so there's nothing there's nothing about well, the way this works that would make us concerned about these vaccines. You know, they're they're being very rigorously watched. There's an amazing study being led out of Auckland that has something like 217 million people in it around the world um, that are you know are looking for how are these going to impact us long term. But as I say, nothing is popping up, um, and there's everything. Whereas everything we're, you know, people are concerned about is happening with with um, the virus. So I'm, you know, I'm fully vaccinated. I know exactly which which horse I'm betting on. Okay, uh, thanks, Max. So yeah, I think that was a really fascinating presentation, and uh, particularly how you answered a number of those more complex, difficult questions that the uh, audience threw at you um, in terms that we could all understand. So I'd, I'd like to thank you very much for that. Um, we now bring this session to a close and if people can remember um, to click on the sort of left button on, up on the corner of your browser so you can go back to the main program um, and then you'll be able to uh, click on the next session which is um, from Minister Nash which will be starting at about uh, in, a, in about an hour's time so you can join him to hear on the economic status of the country. Okay, thank you. Thank you.